once it starts recording. Okay, so um, friends in the classroom, hang on, sorry. Put everything away. Put everything away. Let's get it going. Um, Sean, no kinetic sand on your desk, not when I'm teaching. Make it go away. Okay. Um, okay. Jason, we're done with that. Waiting for everyone to clean off their desk. Yeah, your orange is fine. No, I mean like to stop what they're doing. I'm, there's still one person that hasn't stopped what they're doing. Okay, he's done now. Um, all right. Um, so today we're going to review another. Yesterday we did similes and metaphors. Today we're going to quickly review another type of figurative language. Hey, Mom, Personification. Josie. Um, so it's where uh, you something that isn't human has human characteristics. Like if a tree was talking and an animal was talking. The, um, yep, and Zeke gave dancing. another example. The leaves were dancing. What was that, Gray? The leaves were dancing. The leaves were dancing in the wind. Yeah. So it's when you give something that is not human and you give it human like qualities. Why would an author do that? Why would it be, why would an author want to use personification? Fiona, why would an author want to do that? Okay. She says it can be entertaining to read that. Um, Sam, what are your thoughts on it? Right. Okay. So it's going to make your story more interesting. Um, Zeke. Um, I think this can be like go deeper in and describe their amazement and their like really Okay, I'm going to, Zeke said it goes deeper in describing, first he said their movement, then he said, or their noise. So if I'm thinking of movement, I'm thinking of noise. Um, what, help me, there's a word that helps with this, Maggie. Uh, I don't know if it goes with this, but like, it gives it more description. More description. And it gives it more description yeah. and... Oh, what was it? I knew it, but I forgot what it was. Um, Lily. Hi. More action. More action. Isn't it more description, more description, more action. When we're right. writing using the senses. Is it more character? No. We mm, have no. Characters. Riley. Imagery. Imagery. That's um, the word I wanted. Um, okay. Um, so it helps you better picture in your head, right? If, um, it says the wind was blowing. Okay. Thank you. But the leaves were dancing in the wind. Does that give you instantly a better picture, a more descriptive picture in your mind? Yeah. Then the wind was blowing. Can you see the wind blowing? Yeah. No. no. Just like if I'm just standing outside and there's no trees or anything around, the wind is blowing. I can feel it on my face or my skin. But unless I'm looking at other objects, I don't necessarily see the wind. The wind is clear, right? It's invisible. Air. It's air moving, right? So, um, and it can describe a sound. Um, it can describe what something looks like. Um, so it, anytime you hear that personification and it's giving it a human-like quality, it is, it's giving it movement, it's giving it action. And the author does that so that it helps you better picture what's happening in your mind. And you get a more descriptive picture in your mind. Um, and Sam said something. He said, Brian might start to kind of like be just as he's looking around the forest, be automatically like thinking in the personification mindset and giving human like qualities to some of the things around him. Um, I like that thought. Um, 
why would Brian, why did you say Brian would be looking at random trees and leaves and animals as if they were human? Because he's alone he's in the lonely. forest. He's going to get lonely pretty quick, probably. And bored. And bored. Okay. You, know, you can think of something outside. Outside is All right. Awesome. Maggie. Um, well, uh, if they, they don't really like give it a description or basically kind of like a personality, it wouldn't really like make, it would make the story kind of boring because like you want to have any things to like go with it, you can't really imagine it real well. Okay. And if you give it more like, um, Personality okay it gives it more personality more character um, without personification or really without figurative language at all without similes metaphors personification onomatopoeia all of those different things idioms um, a story would be pretty boring honestly um, so that's why the writer is using that it gives it it does it gives it more action it helps you with imagery and it gives everything a little bit more personality which makes you as a reader want to continue reading it's not a boring story it makes it a more interesting story that helps you get involved the more you can picture things in your head at least for me the better i can picture it the more enjoyable the story is to me right the more connections i can make the better i can picture it the more interested i am is there a hatchet for me yes okay so we're gonna um do a little bit of review of similes, metaphors, and personification. Yes, Jeopardy! Um, and I think it's going to be virtual versus in person. I mean, that's. You went down, virtual! Wow, there's some smack talk going on. Um, all right. So, hang on. There's way less of them. So they get to go first. Yes, That's fair. Okay. Um, so um, you guys might want to unmute. Kay oh my gosh, we got Kane on screen live oh with a smile. All right. So this is a, this is an exciting day now. It's getting real in here. Okay, guys. Um, Lucas is unmuted. I mean, this is a big this is a big event. Well, hold on. Kendall doesn't care. She just is along for the ride. All right. Um, Kay, I'm excited to see your face for, I don't know, maybe the almost the first time this year. Um, so, Kane, pick a category and a dollar amount. Say it 500. Say it for 500. All right. Looking how the Kage is an example of <gasps> simile, metaphor, personification are your choices. You guys may discuss. We'll give you a second to discuss. Mute yourself. Um, yeah. They can't mute. Turn down um, your volume. I will mute. I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute so you guys can talk. Personification. Okay. Was they still here? No, we have to mute for. Nothing. Wait, what is it? This part? Do you guys have your answer? No. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm muting the volume in our room so you guys can discuss out loud with each other. So I'm going to oh, mute us so okay. we can hear it. Um, Go. It's probably, since it's 500, I agree it's probably personification so you're ready to steal it it does say life but it does say life that's what's getting me but that might be a trick since it's 500 is like what are huggies <laughs> nothing hugs like hugs. diapers that's what huggies are Hold on, let's break it down and see. It's personification. Like, That's what it is. Yes, never mind. It's personification. Mm-hmm. All right, do you guys have your answer? Yeah. All right, so, Kane or Joe, somebody give it to me. What do you think it is? 
Personification. 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 Yeah. All right, so you're team one. Pulled, Give it to you. All right. Okay. Um, face to face, kids. Um, Fiona, pick one. Quickly. Your choice, 500. Your choice, 500. Simile, metaphor, or personification. The goalkeeper was a rock in the bottom of his team, sinking burlap sack. I feel like we don't even need to discuss that one. Because it says he was a rock. It's a metaphor. Okay. Metaphor, they said they got it right. Okay. All right. Um, this time we'll say, Lucas, pick a category. Um, say it for 400. Say it for 400, all right. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Um, do you guys, I will mute so that you guys can discuss it. Mute you. Mute you. Okay. Um, Lucas, what do you think it is? Uh, well, let me read it. Well, it says like. Yeah, I'd say it's similarly since it's, um, it says like. Because it's definitely not a metaphor. You guys ready? I don't know. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, give it to me. What do you think? Simile. That was like a whisper. Simile. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. All right. Um, Lillers, pick something. Sing it for 500. Selena Gomez sings, I love you like a love song, baby. This is an example of simile. How do you know? Like. What did you say? Which one came? Five hundred. Which which category? Let's go. Um, um, take two. Okay. You fit me like a fishing hook in my eye. Compares these two things. Okay, so it's not asking what type of figurative language it's asking which two things are being compared i will mute so you can discuss it's a no it's the uh, compares two things so I think it's comparing whoever he's talking about or she's talking about to the fishing hook in his eye. Sure, let's go with that. Cam, you say that. Okay. Um, we have our answer. Okay, all right, hit me with it. It is the person that is talking, the girl or the boy, and the fishing hook in his eye or her eye. Okay. What? Yeah, the in-person kids would have missed it. I knew it. <laughs> All right. Uh, good job, guys. Um, you fit me like a fishing hook. So it was comparing you and the fishing hook, not the fishing hook in the eye. Okay. Um, in-person kids. Let's see here. Sam. Sam Pitt. Giving human qualities to non. They say personification. All right. Um, virtual friends. What are we going with? Define with four hundred. 
Comparing two things as if they are the same. I will mute so you can discuss. Um, I'm going to have to say simile because you know, simile. Guess, whenever you do it with a metaphor, you're yeah, like, it is what you're talking about. You don't want to pay attention and answer. Simile is just comparing. But metaphor is like, this is this. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's your answer? Uh, I think uh, Cameron, you just say, I have no idea what we chose. We think it's a simile because with metaphors, you're telling them this is this. So if you're comparing me, me to a cheetah, then I am a cheetah. But if you're a simile, I'm just comparing myself. But if it's a metaphor, so I literally simile am. Simile or metaphor? This says simile. compares two things as if they simile. are the same. Simile. simile. It's a metaphor. Yeah! yeah! It said as if they are the same. Yeah. It's not yeah. saying they're yeah. like. You have to wait way 400 of them. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, you no I just gave the points to you. Okay. I don't take the weight for it. Good try, though. That's all right, guys. It's all right. Good try. Um. All right. Zeke, what are we going with? Sing at 400. Abba sings, nothing can capture the heart like a melody can. This is... Can you give us some time? Would you mute? All right, I'm going to mute them. They want to discuss. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. You say what, guys? It does, but it also says capture. I told you, people. No, Jason, you should be good sportsmanship. I don't know. I'm gonna go with what it says, though. So. Uh, oh, I didn't give them a chance to steal. So we just have to lose the points. So sorry. Um, all right. What? And, and all right, virtual friends, your turn. I think we should go with your choice, 400. Okay. Simile metaphor personification. Good morning, America. How are ya? All right, I will mute so you can discuss. We're going to see it. Hang on, I'm going to. It is. It's I think it is a modification. Modification. I think it's a metaphor. I think, I think personification because they're saying it as if America's alive. America isn't alive. Yeah, that yes, because how can America why are we saying good morning to America? Because America isn't really technically a person or alive. So I can say personification. Really talking to the living things in America, but it just sounds like you're giving America a human quality and saying good morning. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Sure. Yeah, America's part of the geosphere, not the biosphere. Oh. Yeah. Sound <laughs> vacation. Um, Mrs. Bab, we're ready. We have our answer. Okay, go for it. Personification. Personification. Good job. Sean doesn't matter. Good job. All right. Um. Take two. My ex was like a rooster who thought the sun has risen just to hear him crow compares these two things. Which two things are getting compared? I will mute for discussion. Um, can 
can you turn the sound down because we're going to discuss so that we can have a backup. Oh, sorry. All right, we're back. They say, what is your answer? All right. Do virtual friends, do you guys agree or do you want to try and steal it? Do you have anything different? I think that's it. All right. Um, I think we're actually going to call it. We're going to go. Get rid of all the three hundies. Three hundies? <laughs> made me think like you were saying undies. I was like, get rid of the undies. And I'm like, no. No, don't get rid of your undies. Um, okay. We're going to kill the uh, sing it column. And then when the sing it column is done, the game is over. Whoever wins, wins. Sound fair? No. Yeah. All right. Say it and sing it. Bon Jovi sings. Your love is like bad medicine. This is an example of simile. 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 All right. They got it first. Okay, it's gonna be lightning round. So whoever shouts it out first. Oh, it's lightning round. All right, lightning round. Shout it out. Lord goodness. All right, I'm gonna have to listen careful. Cheryl Crow sings. Every day is a wine. Not a four. Not a four. We're tied. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh. I do this, guys. Okay, we got this. Anybody can shout out. This is anybody can shout out. Lightning round for all the marbles. Wait, you can't answer until you can't answer until I have read the question. Sean, what did I just say? You can't answer until I have read the question. Elton John sings. She lived her life like a candle in the wind. I heard it in here first. I don't know. But everybody got it right. Good job, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed that. That was fun. We'll try and do like a Jeopardy challenge like that again. I think you guys really enjoyed that. Did you guys like that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. I mean, it got Kane and Lucas and everybody talking. Um, so that was exciting. Okay. Bye, Kane. We'll see you later. Uh, okay. We're gonna read Hatchet now. All right. Have a seat. Come down. Oh, Sam, will you pull the door shut? He's just turning the screen off. He's still here. He just doesn't want to look at us anymore. He doesn't want us looking at him anymore. It's okay. We'll just look at Josie. She's all we have to look at. Oh, I don't need to present anymore. Okay. Okay. Focus. Okay. All right. Chapter seven. Here we go. When we left off. He had fallen asleep. He found some berries and he ate them. Yeah. I Josie guess. swears that that bush is poisonous in her yard. Um, so let's see. I don't know because Mother. there are no berries there. Okay. I'm going to find out because when he went to bed, it said his stomach was turning on the berries. Mother. He screamed it and he could not be sure if the scream awakened him or the pain in his stomach. His whole abdomen was torn with great rolling jolts of pain, pain that doubled him in the darkness of the little shelter, put him over and face down in the sand to moan again and again, mother, 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 never anything like this, never. It was as if all the berries, all the pits had exploded in the center of him, ripped and tore at him. He crawled out the doorway and was sick in the sand, then crawled still farther and was sick again. Vomiting and with terrible diarrhea for over an hour. 
for over a year, he thought, until he was at last empty and drained of all strength. Then he crawled back into the shelter and fell again to the sand, but could not sleep at first, could do nothing except lie there, and his mind decided then to bring the memory up again. In the mall. Every detail. His mother sitting in the station wagon with the man, and she had leaned across and kissed him. Kissed the man with the short blonde hair. And it was not a friendly peck, but a kiss. A kiss where she turned her head over at an angle and put her mouth against the mouth of the blonde man who was not his father and kissed mouth to mouth. And then brought her hand up to touch his cheek and his forehead while they were kissing. And Brian saw it. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. having a book in front of their Why face. Everybody's no. blushing. Um, all right. I said no. Naughty kissing. I don't know who. Okay. Saw this thing that his mother did with the blonde man. <laughs> okay. The blonde man. The blonde man saw the kiss that became the secret that his father still did not know about. Ooh, know all about. about the memory was so real that he could feel the heat in the mall that day. <laughs> could he just did a frowny face kind of a, mm. um, could, okay. Could remember the worry that Terry would turn and see his mother could remember the worry of the shame of it. And then the memory faded and he slept again awake for a second, perhaps two. He did not know where he was, was still in his sleep somewhere. Then he saw the sun streaming in the open doorway of the shelter and heard the close, vicious whine of the mosquitoes and knew. He brushed his face completely welted now with two days of bites, completely covered with lumps and bites, and was surprised to find the swelling on his forehead had gone down a great deal, was almost gone. The smell was awful and he couldn't place it. Then he saw the pile of berries at the back of the shelter and remembered the night and being sick. Too many of them, he said aloud. Too many gut cherries. He crawled out of the shelter and found where he'd messed the sand. He used sticks and cleaned it as best he could, covered it with clean sand, and went down to the lake to wash his hands and get a drink. I'm going to pause there. Why do you think he called them gut cherries? We don't have any clue what those are. Jason, why do you think he called them gut cherries? Because it probably hurt his gut. It hurt his gut? It's gut okay. <laughs> Gut bomb. Okay. Um, yeah, they hurt his yeah. gut. Okay. And then he had a cherry bomb. Okay. <laughs> it was still very early. Well, what color did he say they were? Red. Red and small and round. So they kind of resembled maybe like a small cherry. And, and they had pits like a cherry. And they hurt his gut. Okay. Poisonous cherry. How did he go to the bathroom with all that? How did he go to the bathroom without a bathroom? In the sand. I don't think he had time to dig a hole. You should dig a hole. I don't think he had time to dig a hole. All right, here we go. Easy reminder what they are. Okay, it was still very early, only just past true dawn, and the water was so calm he could see his reflection. It frightened him. His face was cut and bleeding, swollen and lumpy, the hair all matted, and on his forehead a cut had healed, but left the hair stuck with blood and scab. His eyes were slits in the bites, and he was somehow covered with dirt. He slapped the water with his hand to destroy the mirror. Ugly, he thought. Very, very ugly. And he was, at that moment, almost overcome with self-pity. He was dirty and starving and bitten and hurt and lonely and ugly and afraid and so completely miserable that it was like being in a pit, a dark, deep pit with no way out. He sat back on the bank and fought crying, then let it come and cried for perhaps three, four minutes, long tears, self-pity tears, wasted tears. Why are they, why did he say wasted tears? Maggie, why are they wasted tears? Because he's not like, this is what I'm saying. Oh, because he's like, not like, oh, I know. I don't know. Okay, Sean, why do you, why wasted tears? Because no one's there to help him. Yeah, no one's there to help, help him. No one hears him. 
No one is there to sympathize or empathize and care about him crying. Like normally when you cry, like somebody's around maybe and they're like, give you a hug. It's okay, baby. There's no one there to like help him out. And does crying Zeke? It, um, Zeke says crying's a bad choice. It's wasting his dehydrated. tears because That's tears so are liquid from your body. He's already probably close to dehydrated, wasting the little bit of fluid that he has in his body. Um, and Fiona. Wasted tears meaning like he is um, sitting there crying while he could be out looking for food, getting dirty, looking for a better place to get water and better, fresher water. Okay. Dead body water. Yep. All right. Fiona says also wasted because... Cry, sitting there crying isn't solving anything. He should be using that time to just suck it up, go find some fresh water so he's not drinking dead body water, and uh, go find some better food, go try and solve some more problems. Wasting his time crying is not solving anything, not helping anything. Okay? So you guys came up with a lot of good reasons why they could be considered wasted. All right? And all of them, I think, are correct, valid reasons. Like, it could be wasted for all of those reasons. Okay? He stood, went back to the water, and took small drinks. As soon as the cold water hit his stomach, he felt the hunger sharpen as it had before. And he stood and held his abdomen until the hunger cramps receded. He had to eat. He was weak with it again, down with the hunger, and he had to eat. Back at the shelter, the berries lay in a pile where he had dumped them when he grabbed his windbreaker. Gut cherries, he called them in his mind now, and he thought of eating some of them. Not such a crazy amount as he had, which he felt brought on the sickness in the night but just enough to stave off the hunger a little bit. He crawled into the shelter. Some flies were on the berries, and he brushed them off. He selected only the berries that were solidly ripe, not the light red ones, but the berries that were a dark maroon, red to black, and swollen in ripeness. When he had a small handful of them, he went back down to the lake and washed them in the water. Small fish scattered away when he splashed the water up, and he wished he had a fishing line and hook. Then he ate them carefully, spitting out the pits this time. They were still tart, but had a sweetness to them, although they seemed to make his lips a bit numb. When he finished, he was still hungry, but the edge was gone and his legs didn't feel as weak as they had. He went back to the shelter. It took him half an hour to go through the rest of the berries and sort them, putting all the fully ripe ones in a pile on some leaves and the rest in another pile. When he was done, he covered the two piles with grass he tore from the lake shore to keep the flies off and went back outside. They were awful berries, those gut cherries, he thought. But there was food there, food of some kind, and he could eat a bit more later tonight if he had to. For now, he had a full day ahead of him. He looked at the sky through the trees and saw that while there were clouds, they were scattered and did not seem to hold rain. There was a light breeze that seemed to keep the mosquitoes down, he thought looking up along the lake shore. If there was one kind of berry, there should be other kinds, sweeter kinds. If he kept the lake in sight as he'd done yesterday, he should be all right, should be able to find home again, and it stopped him. He had actually thought it that time. Home. Three days? No, two? Or was it three? Yes, this was the third day, and he had thought of the shelter as home. Why is that a big deal to think of the shelter as home? Josie, why is that a big deal for him to think of the shelter as home? Because he's living on his own, and that's his practically his home now until someone comes and finds him. But he doesn't want to think of it as his home because it's not his home. It's just a little shelter. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better. You're right. He has no choice but to kind of think of it as home because it's the one place he has right now. But... It's definitely not a home when you think about a home. It's some sticks that he put against a carved out rock wall and there's no furniture, no bed, no nothing. It's right now he's still kind of wearing it, but it's all torn. His Jason asked what's going on with his windbreaker. I thought he put it up as a wall. I don't think so, no, because he used it to carry the berries. Um, okay. Um, it didn't say what he used as the door. 
I think he should use grass. I think he cut out. It's, he, he said he, grass and sticks. Okay. All right. So he thought of it as home. He turned and looked at it, studied the crude work. The brush made a fair wall, not weather tight, but it cut most of the wind off. He hadn't done so badly at that. Maybe it wasn't much, but also maybe it was all he had for a home. All right, he thought, so I'll call it home. He turned back and set off up the side of the lake, heading for the gut cherry bushes, his windbreaker bag in his hand. Things were bad, he thought, but maybe not that bad. Maybe he could find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries, and some of those that had been merely red yesterday were now dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe he should stay and pick them to save them. But the explosion in the night was still much in his memory, and he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but tricky to eat. He needed something better. Another hundred yards up the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn another path. These must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear places up like this, as they had the path he had found when the, with the plane when he crashed. Here the trees were not all the way down, but twisted and snapped off halfway up from the ground. So their tops were all down and rotted and gone, leaving the snags poking into the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished once more he could get a fire going. It also made a kind of clearing with the tops of the trees gone. The sun could get down to the ground, and it was filled with small thorny bushes that were covered with berries, raspberries. Zeke. You found a personification. How so? Yeah, the, the trees had broken teeth. The trees had broken teeth? I wondered if anybody was going to catch that. I caught it in my mind, and I kept going. Um, all right, good job. Um, raspberries. These he knew because there were some raspberry bushes in the park, and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked past. The berries were full and ripe, and he tasted one to find it sweet, and with none of the problems of the gut cherries. Although they did not grow in clusters, there were many of them, and they were easy to pick, and Brian smiled and started eating. Sweet juice, he thought. Oh, they were sweet with just a tiny tang. And he picked and ate and picked and ate and thought he had never tasted anything this good. Soon as before, his stomach was full, but now he had some sense and he did not gorge or cram more down. Instead, he picked more and put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking he was rich, rich with food now, just rich. And he heard a noise to his rear, a slight noise, and he turned and saw the bear. I told he could do nothing, think nothing. His tongue, stained with berry juice, stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he stared at the bear. It was black with a cinnamon-colored nose, not 20 feet from him, and big. No, huge. It was all black fur and huge. He had seen one in the zoo in the city once, a black bear, but it had been from India or somewhere. This one was wild and much bigger than the one in the zoo, and it was right there, right there there. Just walk away. The sun caught the ends of the hairs along his back. Shining black and silky, the bear stood on its hind legs half up and studied Brian. Just studied him. Hang on. Hello. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then I'm just going to. All right. She says she might have, they, she might have read it in third grade. Josie, what's it saying on AR when when you try and take the test? Um, let me look back at it. Give me a second. I'm going to pull up securely and look, too, while you're doing that. She's pulling it up now. And my security is so slow. Ugh. Um, 
is it securely that's making everything run slower now? Is securely making everything run slower? Okay. Or is it just... right. Oh, you're not on the school computer. You're on your other computer. I can't see your screen. Okay. What does it say? I am on my computer right now. Oh, it's not. Sh oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hang on. I see it. Hang on. It says start quiz. You can take the quiz when you okay. Click take quiz. No, Miss Beth. It's the um vocabulary quiz. The reading, oh, okay. the reading so, practice yeah. will get me the AR. Screenshot this. Save screen here. It says so. Like when she pulls up one and only Ivan, where'd it go? Josie, go back on it. Um, I'm sorry. The bottom. So literacy skills quiz, vocab practice quiz, the reading practice quiz has a green check mark and says quiz complete. Miss that's one and that's the one and only Ivan. She thinks um, she said that Rothweiler read it to them in third grade as a class. Um, but she just she had totally forgotten she'd read it and she read it on her own right now. I know. Yeah, because last year was 1920. Yeah, so it would have been 1819. Okay. Okay. Josie, is dad home with you today? Yeah. Okay. Miss Blythe said she'll message your dad. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm bye. Okay, sorry guys. Thank you everybody for being patient. Yeah, um, that was the one and only Ivan quiz. That was an accurate quiz. Yeah. That's what she's needing. Okay, thank you. Okay, bear. There's a bear. And half of you probably already read ahead. Okay, um, the bear reared up, half up, and studied Brian, just studied him, then lowered itself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along waffling and delicately using its mouth to lift each berry from the stem and in seconds it was gone gone and brian still had not moved his tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth the tip half out his eyes were wide and his hands were reaching for a berry then he made a sound a low mm. it made no sense it was just a sound of fear that wasn't the bear making that sound that was brian a sound of fear, of disbelief that something that large could have come so close to him without his knowing. It just walked up to him and could have eaten him. And he could have done nothing. Nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened with his legs. A thing he had nothing to do with. And they were running in the opposite direction from the bear, back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in panic. But after he had gone perhaps 50 yards, his brain took over and slowed and finally stopped him. If the bear had wanted you, his brain said... He would have taken you. It is something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating berries. The bear was eating berries, not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood to see you better, study you, and then went on its way eating berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you, did not want to cause you harm. And that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone, the birds were singing, and he saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could see, could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You could not be in the park at night after dark because of the danger. But here, the bear had looked at him and had moved on, and, and this filled his thoughts. The berries were so good, so good, so sweet and rich, and his body was so empty. And the bear had almost indicated that it didn't mind sharing, had just walked away from him and the berries were so good and he thought finally if he did not go back and get the berries he would have to eat the gut cherries again tonight i'm gonna pause here maggie yeah oh or you just like think that the bears don't really bother you unless you like say something don't like if you bother them they bother you okay yeah and they like to eat your trash when you're camping too Okay, Maggie was saying that the bears usually, unless they're like provoked or unless you bother them, they're not going to just randomly like attack you. They have to feel threatened it's in some way. Like it's like a plant. It's like, that's kind of like what the... I feel oh, like, 
A lot of wild animals are that way. Unless you threaten or provoke them, they'll they'll leave you alone. Like what? Uh, and what? Because, and it's, yeah. Okay, here we go. Snakes, you're bigger than snakes, and snakes know you're bigger than snakes. That's they why unless they, they feel threatened, they don't usually bother you. If you accidentally step near or on one, though, and then they feel threatened, and they will bite you. Um, okay. They that convinced him, and he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once when a squirrel rustled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was almost straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had picked and trotted back to the shelter. He'd eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and maybe another three pounds in his jacket rolled in a pouch. He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and the rain roared down in sheets. Soon the sand outside was drenched and there was rivulets running down to the lake. What do you think rivulets is? Like, um, waves, kind of, like, waves. Um, Grayson, give me rivulets. Well, I wasn't going to say anything about that. I was going to say I've caught on to, um, personification. It said, um... I almost jumped on my skin. Nearly. No, not that. What did Kane just say? It. None. It roared down in sheets. Roared down in sheets. Roared down. Okay. All right. Rain can't roar. But yes, you found personification there. Okay. Um, rivulet. Maggie, what do you think? Uh, like leftovers, kind of like didn't soak into the sand and down into like. Uh, okay, some little bits that didn't soak into the sand. Um, Fiona. Okay, well right now I don't really have the original, but I have something that he could be doing right now. He could be out in the rain. He could be getting something. Like fresh water. Fiona says Ding Dong needs to get out there and collect the fresh rainwater. Um, she didn't actually call him Ding Dong. I inferred. Um, based on how she put it. Um, uh, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, but I'm still going to wait and see if anybody can guess it. Zeke, help me. Rivulets. Um, wait, what was the sentence? The sand outside was drenched and there were rivulets running down to the lake. Oh, the rivulets, like, they're the, like, outcasts. Dunes? Like, when I hear rivulets, it makes me think of rivers, except rivulet makes it sound little. So, like, you know, like a little tiny, like, see, little stream running down. You're right. It's water that didn't soak into the ground, and it's running like a teeny, 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 teensy little stream running down the sand back to the lake. Yeah, and it makes like that little hole in the sand, like that little trail in the sand where it was. I can't hear Zeke. Like the survival kit that he could find a canteen or like a water. Wait, how's he going to get a survival kit? From the plane. Oh, Zeke says in either this chapter or the next chapter, he's going to get a survival kit from the plane. It's sooner or later, like, turn up in this chapter or later, and then you can make a fire. You can just make fire. i cover my face. Zeke's just going to the fire. Okay, survival kit. Sounds like a good idea. All right, rivulets running down to the lake. But inside, he was dry and snug. Oh, so his shelter's working. Good. He started to put the picked berries back in the sorted pile with the gut cherries, but noticed that the raspberries were seeping through the jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries and apparently were being crushed a bit by their own weight. When he held the jacket up and le looked beneath it, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put a finger in it and found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fizz. And he grinned and lay back on the sand, holding the bag up over his face and letting the seepage drip down into his mouth. Wait, is that? I think I actually know what's called the gut berries. I think I know what they actually were. Cranberries. Jason says he thinks maybe the gut cherries are cranberries. 
Okay, well, eventually we'll find out. Okay, outside the rain poured down, but Brian lay back drinking the syrup from the berries, dry and with the pain almost gone, the stiffness also gone, his belly full and a good taste in his mouth. And he's just living it up, isn't he? In the woods, all by himself, with nobody. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself, of his own life. Brian was wondering if the bear was as surprised as he was to find another being in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came down, he went to the lake and washed the sticky berry juice from his face and hands and went back to prepare for the night. While he had accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts, and as darkness came into the shelter, he took the hatchet out of his belt and put it by his head, his hand on the handle, as the day caught up with him and he slept. All right, so he's prepared just in case the berry bear comes back. All right, um, berry bear. You do not need to do that one, no. Um, okay, you have worksheet. Um, you guys are going to have to finish it in a little bit because we're about to go to math. You guys can hang up. You got like a five minute break and then be back for math. Okay, and I will see you guys here in just a second again. I'm going to hang up.